Hello everyone, my name is James and I am an adult services librarian at the New Canaan Library. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to tonight's program, Hidden Things, Pulling Back the Veil on the Universe, presented by EL Science Communication. Um, and with that, I'm very happy to hand it over to the presenters. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll let you get started. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Um, good, okay. So my name is Melanie. I uh, am a graduate student at Yale in the biology department, uh, and I'm one of the coordinators for this talk tonight. Um, so I know myself, I've personally learned a lot from our two speakers that we're gonna hear from tonight, uh, just in the course of helping uh, put these talks together. So uh, I'm really excited for the, for the talks this evening, and I think you'll um, really enjoy uh, what our speakers have to say. Um, so uh, the, the title of our set of talks is called Hidden Things, Pulling Back the Veil on the Universe. Um, and so before I get into a little bit more detail about what we, what we mean by that and what we're gonna hear tonight, um, I'll go ahead and introduce our two speakers. So first up, we'll hear from Tiger. Uh, he's a graduate student in the astrophysics department at Yale, and he studies planets, um, but mostly planets that are around other stars. Um, however, tonight he will be telling us about a possible planet that is hidden in our own solar system. Um, and when he's not studying planets, he spends a lot of his free time running. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Jorge. Um, Jorge is a postdoctoral researcher in the physics department at Yale. Uh, and he studies particles called neutrinos. Um, so this is something I didn't know much about before seeing his talk. So um, we're gonna learn a lot about this tonight. Um, and then a, another fun fact about Jorge is that he has done salsa dancing for the past 10 years. So before we get started with the first talk, I'd like to introduce some of the common themes that will be coming up through each of these talks. The title, as I said, of the set of talks today is Hidden Things, Pulling Back the Veil on the Universe. So in each of the two talks, our speakers will tell us about objects that are as big as planets or as small as tiny particles that are hidden in our universe. This drawing might look familiar to you. It's, it's a depiction of the planets in our solar system. Um, however, the, the image that we have um, in our minds of what the planets in our solar system look like um, has not really been static throughout history, as we may think. Um, so in his talk tonight, Tiger will tell us about a pretty large object, a planet-sized object, in fact, um, that may be hiding uh, right in our own um, solar system. So, Things that we can't necessarily see with our own eyes or with conventional telescopes, they, they still often leave clues that tell us where to look. Um, so after hearing about a planet-sized hidden object in our solar system, we'll next learn about tiny particles that help us to quote unquote see or detect things from far, far away in the universe. And we'll learn why these particles uh, called neutrinos earn a nickname called ghost particles. So with that, um, I'll just go back and introduce again our two speakers. Uh, we'll hear from Jorge, first, sorry, from Tiger first, talking about the search for Planet Nine, followed by Jorge talking about neutrinos. Um, all right, great, thank you. And I will hand it over to Tiger. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Uh, can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. As Melanie said, I research planets both in our own solar system and around other stars. And today I'm very excited to talk to you all about one of the most intriguing possibilities in modern astronomy, which is the possibility that Planet Nine is out there. Uh, so what is Planet Nine exactly? Well, Planet Nine is the idea for which there's been mounting evidence over the past few years that there's another large undiscovered planet in the far reaches of our solar system. Uh, now in this figure, all the planets are to scale and the distances aren't. Well, I, I guess not everything here is a planet, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and as you can see, Planet Nine is a pretty large world and would represent a pretty significant update. In fact, the first significant update to our knowledge of the solar system in almost a century. But before we dive into some of the implications of what a Planet Nine discovery would mean, uh, let's put this in context a little bit and walk through the history of our knowledge of the solar system. So since ancient times, we've known of six planets, including the Earth. These are 
Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. We've known of all these planets essentially forever because they were bright enough to be easily seen with the naked eye. So this is what our this is what we thought our solar system looked like uh, essentially since ancient times. And the first major update to this picture came in the year 1781 when the planet Uranus was discovered via telescope by an astronomer named William Herschel. While Uranus is technically visible with the naked eye, it was so dim that it was able to evade detection until telescopes arrived. Now, something's not quite right with our wonderful solar system because there's something that's subtly not right with Uranus. And to explain what's wrong here, I, we have to understand the force that makes the planets go around the sun, which is gravity. Uh, many of you will have heard the story of an apple falling on Isaac Newton's head. Uh, that same force that pulled the apple towards the Earth is actually the force that pulls planets and keeps them orbiting around the sun. And it turns out that if we know the sizes of both bodies, in this case, the sun and Uranus, we can very accurately predict Uranus's orbit around the sun. Given this knowledge, astronomers can then translate knowledge of Uranus's orbit onto Earth's night sky. So for example, if we see Uranus here on a Monday, right, astronomers are able to predict, oh, it'll show up here on Tuesday and here on Wednesday. So we'll call this Uranus's predicted path. When astronomers actually went to look at where Uranus was, they saw something slightly different. So Uranus was still here on Monday, but on Tuesday, it was maybe here. And on Wednesday, it was here. So this is obviously a bit of a crude artist's rendition. But the point here is that Uranus was in a slightly different place than we expected it to be. So why is this? Did we miscalculate something? Well, probably not. Uh, even back in those times, gravity was, was known incredibly well. So one theory that has some merit is that there's another planet even further out. So just as the sun pulls on Uranus with a gravitational force, if there was a planet even further out than Uranus, it would pull on it in the opposite direction. And these tiny pulls over time would lead to these tiny discrepancies that we see on the sky. Now, an astronomer by the name of Urbain Le Verrier championed this idea that there was another planet even further out. And lo and behold, in the year 1846, an astronomer by the name of Johann Galli discovered the planet Neptune, exactly where Le Verrier had predicted. Now, let's emphasize how incredible of a discovery this was, because with nothing but math and using Neptune's unseen effects on Uranus, uh, Le Verrier was able to take these positions of Uranus on the night sky and predict the existence of an entirely new world without ever seeing it. So this is going to be a very important concept, the fact that these worlds have unseen influences on everything around them. So just remember that for the rest of this talk, because we're going to come back to this. So the discovery of Neptune set off a ton of interest in these hidden worlds. And the astronomy, com the astronomical community in the 1900s was really just kind of a race to find all of these hidden worlds. And most of the ideas didn't lead anywhere. But there was a project called Planet X that did lead to something interesting. So the Planet X project was motivated by even more issues with the orbits of both Uranus and Neptune, pretty similar to what I showed you earlier with Uranus's orbit. Well, if it worked once, it would probably work again, right? We fix the issues with Uranus's orbit by adding another planet. Let's fix these issues by adding yet another planet even further out. So this is what astronomers thought Planet X might look like, a pretty large world, right? Uh, due to the size of the discrepancies, it was expected to be around the size of Uranus or Neptune. Now, in the year 1930, an astronomer by the name of Clyde Tombu discovered Pluto, exactly where Planet X was predicted in 1930. Uh, but this wasn't quite the triumphant discovery Neptune was, because right off the bat, there were a few issues. Uh, most notably, Pluto was tiny. Uh, so if this is what planet I X might look like in our solar system, this is what Pluto would look like. And uh, yeah, you can barely see it on this picture. Uh, so Pluto was so small, there's no way it would be, it could be responsible for the effects we saw on Uranus and Neptune. It was, it just was far too small to cause those effects. And it turns out that discovery of Pluto exactly where planet X was predicted 
was nothing but coincidence. And the issues with Neptune and Uranus's orbits ended up just due to Neptune being slightly smaller than we originally thought. So now we arrive at the sad part of the story, where Pluto is demoted from planet status, coincidentally by my old professor at Caltech, Mike Brown. Uh, and the definition of planet is a little controversial, but the main point astronomers tend to agree on is that a planet needs to be the dominant body in its orbit. And what that means is it needs to be the largest body that orbits the sun, or roughly orbits the sun around where it is. And in the 1900s, we actually discovered, we started discovering tons of other bodies pretty close to Pluto around the same size. Uh, the death blow for Pluto came in the year 2005 when the body Eris was discovered. Now, and this was devastating for Pluto because Eris was actually slightly larger than Pluto. Uh, so the argument goes, if Pluto is a planet, surely Eris, which is larger, has to be a planet as well. And then it became a question of where to draw the line. Do we draw the line at eight planets? Do we draw at 10? Do we have 100 planets? Uh, well, we decide to draw the line right here. So Eris is not a planet, and neither is Pluto. Today, we know of these bodies as just some of thousands of bodies in what's called the Kuiper Belt beyond the orbit of Neptune. And this is a vast collection of tiny, icy bodies and this is not just where the objects you saw earlier are from, like Pluto and Eris, but also where a lot of famous comets are from, such as Halley's Comet. Uh, now I'd like to draw your attention to one of these bodies in particular. Uh, this here is Sedna. And Sedna is not special because of its size, but it's special because of its extremely unusual orbit. So uh, what does Sedna's orbit look like exactly? Let's take a look at it in the context of the solar system. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start building up the solar system, starting from our center, the sun. Uh, there's a little scale here on the screen. This represents one astronomical unit, or one AU. This is the average distance from the Earth to the sun, and is a pretty standard unit of measurement in astronomy. So let's start building. We have our four inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, and all the distances in this figure are to scale as well. And Jupiter, from our perspective, is pretty far out. But if uh, from the perspective of the solar system, Jupiter is really just a stone's throw from the sun. So if we zoom out a bit here, we'll be able to see the four outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now you might be wondering, oh, sorry, forgot to add Pluto for old time's sake, even though it's not a planet anymore. Now you might be thinking, where's Sedna? Well, it's actually out in this direction somewhere. Uh, how far is it? Uh, it turns out we're actually going to have to zoom out very, very far. Yes, very far. In fact, Sedna orbits the sun at an average distance of 500 AU. So that's almost 20 times the distance to Neptune. Now, the most striking feature of Sedna's orbit is its size. But there's another more subtle aspect that I'd like to draw your attention to. And it's the fact that while most of the other planets have very well-behaved circular orbits, Sedna's is a very elongated oval. And crucially, one side of Sedna's orbit is much closer to the sun than the rest of its orbit. Now, while Sedna is indeed incredibly unique, it's not exactly alone either. As of the year 2013, we knew of 13 other objects with very similar orbits to Sedna, uh, and their orbits are shown in this picture here. And once again, something's not quite right. Uh, if you look at this figure a little more closely, you'll realize that all of these tiny Sedna-like objects are pointed in one direction. Uh, this is very unexpected because all else being equal, we'd expect them to be scattered every which way. The, you wouldn't expect them to have any preference to be pointing in this direction. Uh, so think about having 13 dice and rolling them all, right? Uh, we'd expect a pretty random assortment of numbers to pop up. Uh, this orbital configuration we see here is the equivalent of rolling 13 dice and having all of them show six. So one of two things must be true. Either this is just some massive coincidence, or there must be something forcing the orbits in one direction. Well, coincidences are generally pretty rare in astronomy, especially when the data is so striking. So option two seems a lot more reasonable. And some astronomers have an idea, another planet. So let's imagine another planet oriented this way. And you can imagine that when this planet gets 
towards the part of its orbit close to the sun, it would attract all these tiny sentinel-like objects and draw all their orbits towards it. And I'm sure you've guessed by now, this is the mysterious planet nine I've been building towards this whole time. So now we return to the question of what is planet nine? There's very little that we concretely know about planet nine. Keep in mind that we've never seen it with our own eyes. We were only inferring the existence of this hidden world through its influence on the cosmos around it. So therefore, we really can't say much about it. We don't know if it's a rocky world like Earth or a gas giant like some of the outer planets, for example. Uh, what we do know is that we have some rudimentary estimates of its size and its orbit based on the effects we see on these sentinel-like objects. So based on these effects, we can estimate Planet 9 to be around five Earth masses and orbiting the sun at around 400 AU. So it's likely a pretty large world. Uh, in size, it falls somewhere between the rocky inner planets and the gas giants. Uh, but it's also incredibly distant. Again, just for reference, Neptune orbits at just 30 AU from the sun compared to 400 for Planet 9. Now, everyone is excited about Planet 9, and for good reason. But it's important to temper this excitement a little because there are a few other things that can explain this data that we see. And the most compelling alternative explanation is something called systematic survey bias. Now, what is systematic survey bias? That's the idea that there are certain things that are easier to see than others. Uh, so imagine you're staring at a great forest from very far away. Uh, you'd probably see nothing but giant, tall, old trees. Uh, does that mean that the forest has nothing but giant, tall, old trees? Probably not, right? It probably means that from your vantage point, these giant tall old trees are A, the easiest to see, and B, obscure everything else. And indeed, if you zoom in a little closer to this forest, you still see the giant tall trees, but you start to see a lot of other things too. You start to see these uh, saplings, you start to see little bushes, all sorts of things that you've missed on the first try. So in this analogy, the giant tall trees are sentinel-like objects. And everything else are sentinel-like objects pointed in different directions that for some reason we just don't see. Uh, to bring this back to the dice analogy, these giant tall trees represent all the dice that rolled sixes. And everything else are the die that have pretty much every face you could imagine. We just don't see them. So what about these sentinel-like objects makes own makes the ones pointed in this direction easier to see. Uh, it's not really clear at the moment, but the argument is simply that there is such a bias. And astronomers have run simulations pretending to run surveys of the sky, uh, accounting for these biases. And they've actually shown that bias, it is possible for bias to be responsible for the clustering we see. Uh, keep in mind that while the data for Planet Nine does seem compelling at the moment, uh, we're basing this entire hypothesis on the motion of just 14 objects. Uh, so while, again, the data is very exciting and very convincing at the moment, it's important to take everything you read about Planet Nine with somewhat of a grain of salt. So it's likely that the debate will not be settled until we actually see Planet Nine with our own eyes. Uh, fortunately, the prospects of detection are very good. And that's because Planet Nine is rapidly running out of places to hide. So we've actually narrowed down Planet Nine's physical and orbital characteristics to a very good, uh, to a very good approximation. So I'm showing here a chart that represents two of Planet Nine's most important characteristics: uh, its mass or its size, and its average orbital distance from the Sun. I've also placed a few helpful benchmarks here. So here is the size of the Earth, the size of Neptune and the size of Jupiter. Here is the distance to Neptune, or 30 times the distance to Earth, 100 times the distance to Earth, and 1,000 times the distance to Earth. Now, if we knew nothing about Planet Nine, it could hypothetically be anywhere on this chart. But luckily for us, we have done a lot of work to rule out significant chunks. So first of all, it must be closer in than this red line. Otherwise, it would, it would be so weakly held on by the sun that we would have expected Planet Nine to have been lost to inter interstellar space basically instantaneously. We also know that Planet Nine must be larger than this green line suggests. If it were any smaller than this, it would be too small to influence the Sedna-like objects in the way that we see. 
uh, it must be also it must be smaller than this purple line here. This purple line represents our knowledge of the mo motions of the giant planets. Uh, in this day and age, we actually know the motions of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to a very good degree of accuracy. And if Planet Nine were any larger than this purple line, we would be able to see Planet Nine's effect imprinted on these tiny motions. The fact that we don't means that it has to be smaller than this purple line. Finally, anything above this yellow line is ruled out by a previous satellite called WISE, which looked at the glowing heat emitted by bodies across the sky. Uh, WISE was more than powerful enough to find anything larger than this yellow line. So the fact that WISE didn't find Planet Nine looking at the entire sky means that Planet Nine has to be smaller than this yellow line. And we've successfully ruled out everything except for this chunk of the graph, which Planet Nine must fit into somehow. We've also predicted Planet Nine's position in the sky pretty well. So Orion's belt is pretty easily visible here in Connecticut, with Orion being one of the most famous constellations out there. So these three bright stars are known as Orion's belt. And on any given day, it's pretty likely you'll be able to see them. And all you have to do is follow these three stars to the north northeast to this bright red star called Aldebaran. Once you found this bright red star, you've essentially found where Planet Nine is supposed to be. Planet Nine is expected to be right in this region somewhere. So we know where Planet Nine is supposed to be. Now we just need a powerful instrument to point there and hope we find it. And luckily for us, that instrument already exists. So this is TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And TESS is a space telescope designed to detect exoplanets. Uh, or planets around other stars. Now, while finding Planet Nine is not exactly one of Tess's science goals, uh, it turns out that if, as you can imagine, looking for planets around other stars requires a very powerful telescope. So Tess is more than powerful enough to detect Planet Nine. And luckily for us, Tess's latest observing run started up last December in the exact area of the sky that Planet Nine is expected to be in. So it's actually very likely that in the next month or two, the debate for Planet Nine will be settled. Uh, either Tess will have found it, or the fact that Tess doesn't find it means that it's probably not there. So let's sum this up. Uh, what do we know for sure about Planet Nine today? Well, not much really. We can't say much for sure. The only thing that we 100% know is that there's something out there causing us to see only sediment like objects pointed in one direction. Uh, whether that's because there's this another giant planet out there or because of some more mundane explanation like bias, we can't say for sure right now. If Planet Nine is out there, what can we reasonably guess about it? Well, we have some idea of its rough orbital of physical characteristics, and we have a pretty good idea of its location on the night sky. What do we hope to learn about Planet Nine in the future? There's a lot we hope to learn. We'd love to find out more precise physical values. We'd love to know what it's made of. We'd love to know if it's a gas giant or a rocky planet like Earth. Uh, but the most important question, and this is the million dollar question here, is the question of, is it really out there? And that's something that we're all desperately hoping to find out in the next few months. Uh, if you're interested in anything I've said in this talk, I'll be dropping a few help, a few links that will be very interesting for the reading in the chat below after here. So next up, Planet Nine will ultimately be discovered by an optical telescope, such as TESS or the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but for much of the universe, that's simply not an option. In fact, the universe that we can directly see is just scratching the surface of an incredibly rich and complex world that in many cases, we have to be a lot more creative about observing. So next up is Jorge Torres to talk about the fascinating topic of neutrinos. So I'm having issues here. Um, okay, this should work now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Sayer. That was a great talk. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, News from Outer Space, which is uh, a wordplay because new is the, oops, sorry. 
Nu is the Greek letter that we physicists use to denote these particles called neutrinos. And in this talk, in this talk, you'll hear how we use these particles uh, for news from outer space to study the very distant and very energetic universe. These, are, these particles are small hidden things that can tell us more about big hidden things. And as you heard from Tiger's really nice talk, he told us about Planet Nine, which can be observed with uh, optical telescopes such as TESS. However, at some point, things in the universe become invisible to these kind of telescopes. And I'm gonna tell you more about that in the next slides. This graph represents our universe in terms of distance and the energy of the things or particles emitted by it. The vertical axis corresponds to how far these uh, objects are from the Earth. The higher you go on the vertical scale, that means farther from us and vice versa. And to give you an idea of these scales that we are talking about, the uh, center of the Milky Way for our galaxy is around here. This is 26,000 light years away from us, which means that if somebody who is living there sends you a Facebook message or a text, it'll take about 26,000 years to arrive. So these are very, very far distances from us. And the horizontal axis corresponds to the energy of the particles that are emitted by these objects. The more you get to the right uh, on the horizontal, horizontal scale, the more energy that these, uh, these particles have. In physics, we use the units electron volts to measure these energies and to give you an idea of what uh, electron volts are, 10, uh, energy of 10 to the 12 electron volts or a one with 12 zeros to the right corresponds to the energy that a flying mosquito has. Another example is that at 10 to the 20 EV, it is the energy similar to the energy that a baseball traveling at 100, mi 100 miles per hour uh, has. So these are huge energies. Now imagine these energies concentrated in a very, very tiny particle. Now that, you, now that we have notions of energy and distance in our universe, you might be wondering what the white and black regions represent. The white region here represents the, the area of the universe that light can travel undisturbed and can reach the Earth and subsequently our telescopes. So we, this is the part of the universe that we can see with, with our telescopes. And uh, the black region corresponds to uh, places where light is absorbed and doesn't reach the Earth. So this means that this area cannot be studied with optical telescopes. And when I talk about conventional or optical telescopes, what I mean is telescopes that observe the light emitted by celestial bodies. This could be telescopes that you can buy on Amazon uh, or telescopes that NASA builds and deploys into space, such as TESS, which we heard from uh, Tiger. As you can see, this region represents the distant because it's kind of high on the vertical scale and the energetic because it's uh, far to the right. So this is a distant and energetic universe. And we want to study it because we don't know how and why the super energetic processes here happen. So this might, this might, those, this might help us understand how the universe forms, for example. Because we can't use optical telescopes, we need another way to observe this part of the universe. And this is where the particles that I mentioned first, neutrinos, come into play. But before I move, I tell you what neutrinos are, I would like to introduce the protagonists, the particle protagonists of this story. And I will categorize them uh, with respect to three features. One of them is the mass, which is related to the weight of the particle, and how many results are returned when you Google their names. So how famous they are in Google, for example. The horizontal axis corresponds to the mass of the particle. So the, the more you go to the right, the heavier the particle. And the vertical axis corresponds to how many results that are in Google when you, you search their name. And the higher on the scale, the more results you get. First, we have the photon, which is represented by the letter gamma. This is uh, what we know as light. And it is a particle that conventional telescopes and our eyes observe. This particle, as you can see, is very famous in Google, but it actually has no mass. And it also doesn't have a charge. So this is, a, this is what we call a neutral particle. We then have the electron. The electron is represented by the letter E, 
And this is what we know as a carrier of electricity. This particle is not very heavy. It is about 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen atom, which is the simplest atom. And this particle is, has a negative charge. We then have the muon. The muon is represented by the letter mu. And you, and you can see that it's not very famous in Google, but it's about 200 times heavier than an electron. And I refer to the muon as a heavy causing of the electron because they have the same charge, they have a negative charge, but they have a deeper mass. So the muon is heavier. An important property of these particles is that when they transfer media such as uh, ice or water, they emit light. And this property will become important for the second, for the last part of my talk. My talk. So keep keep this in mind as we progress. Uh, we then have the the proton. It is very famous in Google because every atom has at least one of them. And this is a very heavy particle compared to the rest of the other particles, and it has a, a positive charge. So this is a, a charged particle. And then finally, we have the the, the protagonist of this story, which is the neutrino. And this is a very interesting particle. It is not famous at all in Google. Uh, and you can see that it's also not very heavy. And this will be the focus of, of this talk. Another thing is that this, this particle is neutral. So this means that it doesn't have a charge. And it's represented by the letter nu. So from now on, when you see this icon here with the letter nu, this will represent a neutrino in my talk. Now, let me tell you more about these amazing particles that neutrinos are. They are small, neutrally charged particles, and that gives, their, gives them their name. The name was given by the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, and neutrino in Italian literally, literally means small, neutral one. They are about 1,000 times smaller than an electron. And these particles, because they don't have an electric charge, are unaffected by magnetic or electric fields. What that means is that if we had a magnet and a pair of charge plates, a charge particle, for example, an electron, will be deflected by both of them and change its direction, as you can see here. On the other hand, a neutral particle, like a neutrino, would just transfer them without being disturbed at all. And this property will be important for studying the universe with them because they don't get deflected. They point back to the source. Neutrinos are very common particles in the universe. They are, in fact, everywhere. They are emitted by bananas. About 10 neutrinos are emitted each second by a, by a banana. They are also emitted by the sun. About 65 million of these solar neutrinos pass through your thumbnail every second. Every second. But these are uh, low energy neutrinos. The ones I just talked about are low energy neutrinos and they are produced by low energy sources close to the earth, such as the sun, the core of the earth, uh, the atmosphere and bananas. And that's a reason why many of them reach the earth because they are produced close to the earth. On the other hand, high energy neutrinos have to be produced by very, very energetic sources, which happen to be far from us such as, for example, black holes. And that's good because if black holes were close to us, we would not exist. These very high energy neutrinos, because they are produced far from us, are not very abundant, unlike low energy neutrinos. And to give you an idea of how many neutrinos we get for the different energies, let me use my cats as neutrino detectors. These are my cats. He is Mescal, she is Paloma. Every second, about one trillion of low energy neutrinos pass through them. On the other hand, one high energy neutrino passes through them every million years. This means that my cats are not big enough to be high energy neutrino detectors. And you might be wondering, if these neutrinos, low energy neutrinos are everywhere, why we don't see them or why they are not famous in Google? Well. The reason is that neutrinos are mostly antisocial, which in particle physics terms means that they barely interact with, with, with things. You might be wondering what interact means. Well, interaction means kind of what it sounds like. Two particles interact with each other or somehow affect each other. So if you might imagine that these uh, billiard balls are particles, uh, sometimes the interaction will change the particle's identity, or in this case, 
particles moving toward each other might change each other's direction. More commonly, uh, interaction means that they rip, rip each other apart and the energy is releasing other forms of energy, for example, light or heat. Low energy neutrinos, on the other hand, are very antisocial. So they just do this. They keep going and they do not interact. To give you an idea of what low interaction means, let me give you a few analogies. Imagine that you shine a flashlight on a concrete wall. You might have seen that the light doesn't go through the wall. And that means that photons, which are the particles of light, are highly interacting particles. And they interact with the atoms on the wall very, very ra rapidly. Now, imagine an electron traveling towards the wall. This electron won't be stopped as quickly as a photon, but it'll penetrate the wall about an inch and then interact with the wall atoms. That's why you need somewhat thicker walls to shield radiation or the kind of apron that they give you when you go to get x-rays. So you shield these particles because they can penetrate a little bit. And Finally, a neutrino. A neutrino will cross the wall and it will not interact at all with the atoms because they are antisocial. And that's what I mean when we say that neutrinos barely interact. In fact, it'll take about one light year or 5.9 trillion miles of lead to make one of these low energy neutrinos interact. And because of this, we call neutrinos ghost-like particles. So now this icon of the little ghost with the letter nu at, in the center will represent a neutrino in my talk. Now, there are other, there's one special case when these neutrinos become sort of social, and that's when they have very high energies or high energy neutrinos, which if you remember, corresponds to the right edge of the universe plot that I showed you before. In fact, one of these neutrinos could transfer the earth as sorry could, could cross the earth and interact as it transverses it and if we had detectors around this area we might be able to see that the signature of this interaction is light so if we want to see this light we need a transparent medium such as water or ice now what can we learn from these high energy neutrinos well there are a few things that we can learn they are one of the most energetic, energetic particles in the universe, but we do not know how they are produced at these very high energies. If we identify one of these astrophysical sources that produces them, we could not only learn about their origin, but also about the origin of other particles created inside that object. For example, cosmic rays, but that's a topic for another talk. And finally, we can study particle physics at these super high energies for free. In the Earth, we use accelerators and other kind of experiments. Uh, for example, maybe some of you might have heard of the Large Hadron Collider, which is an accelerator based in the uh, border of France and Switzerland. But these experiments cost billions and billions of dollars. On the other hand, these neutrinos are produced in space for free, so we can study particle physics for free. So now that we know what neutrinos are, let's go back to this plot. These dark shaded part of the universe can actually be observed with one of these particles, with neutrinos, but not with other kind of particles. And I'll tell you why in my next slide. Imagine one of these very distant and very energetic astrophysical objects that are billions and billions of light years away. These these objects will emit different kinds of particles. Some of these particles will be protons. Now, there are magnetic fields in the universe. And if you recall, magnetic fields affect these charged particles by changing its direction. So these protons will be deflected and never reach the Earth. But neutral particles, such as photons, for example, continue their uh, their, their uh, journey on this circle. But if you recall at some point, because photons are highly interacting particles, they will interact and disappear and they will never reach the Earth. They will disappear in other forms of energy. And then finally, neutrinos. 
they just keep going because one, they have no charge, so they travel in a straight line, and then two, they are antisocial. But you know, they could eventually reach the Earth, and because at high energies they are somewhat social with the Earth, they can be detected there. And this is what the field of neutrino astronomy studies. This uh, is kind of a young field. It was born in the early 90s. And what it does is it studies the, the distant and energetic universe with neutrinos. But this is hard. As, as I mentioned previously, there are not many of these neutrinos and they are very antisocial, meaning that we need another kind of detectors and not the telescopes that we currently have. Uh, the properties that allow them to arrive to Earth are also the properties that make them hard to detect. So if we want to detect high energy neutrinos, we need huge experiments. So we can observe the few of them that arrive to Earth every year. We also need uh, transparent media, such as, for example, water or ice. And the reason for that is that the signature of this interaction of neutrinos with the Earth is light. So we need this light to propagate in a transparent medium and reach our detectors. Now, you might be wondering, where can we have those places in the Earth? And maybe if you paid attention to my previous slide, the answer was there. It's actually the Antarctica. This is a real picture of the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, or Ice Cube for short. This experiment is located in the Edmundson Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica. The detector unit for Ice Cube is called the Digital Optical Module, or DUMP for short. On the left, we have a real photography of one of these optical modules. And these are, you can imagine these as very sophisticated cameras that detect very, very dim light emitted by particles that interact with the eyes. IceCube has about 5,100 of these deployed in 86 strings in this configuration between 1,400 and 2,400 meters under the eyes. And if you, if you want to have a scale of how big, how big this experiment is, you can compare it to the size of the Eiffel Tower. So these are very big experiments compared to what we, we usually have in physics. Now, you might be wondering what these optical modules have to do with neutrinos if they detect light or photons and not neutrino, neutrinos themselves. Well, here's where the muons, the heavy costings of the electrons, come into play. We do not observe the neutrinos themselves, but the products of the interaction of neutrinos with the ice or with the water. So when a neutrino comes and arrives and interacts with the ice, sorry, one of the products of this interaction is a muon. And if you remember from my third slide, muons, as they propagate through water or ice, emit light. And this light is what is observed by the photo, by the optical modules that I showed you before. Here's a video of one of these muons that are created. So a neutrino comes and it interacts and it produces a muon. So the muon is what you see propagating uh, in red at, at the front. And the rest of the lines that you see, each of, the, each of those corresponds to a photon. So those photons propagate in the transparent medium and they reach eventually reach the detectors, the optical modules that are hanging on those uh, lines that you see there that are uh, we call strings. So that information is, is transferred to the US. In, in fact, it's transferred to Madison, Wisconsin, which is where all the computers for this experiment are. And this data is analyzed and properties of the neutrino, such as its energy and its uh, origin uh, in the sky are inferred. There are other, other similar detectors in Antarctica that also look for these very energetic neutrinos. One of them is the Ascarian Radio Array, or R experiment. I wrote, my, I wrote my PhD dissertation on this experiment where I studied the data from, from the R experiment. This experiment is located next to IceCube in the South Pole, but instead of optical detectors, it uses antennas that are buried at about 200 meters under the ice, trying to detect radio waves emitted by these neutrinos interacting with the ice. And this is a similar principle to what I described to you in my, in my previous slide. There's another experiment named the Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, or ANITA for short. And this experiment consists in an array of antennas that are attached to a balloon 
and flown over Antarctica. So this array is this array here, and this is the balloon here, which has the size of a baseball stadium, and it flies above the Antarctica at about 37 kilometers for one month, trying to detect these radiation, these radio waves that neutrinos emit when they interact with the ice. But neutrinos don't always like going to places that are frozen. There's another experiment, this one in the Mediterranean, which is called the KM3Net, KM3Net experiment, and it's currently being deployed. This experiment uses a similar principle as ice cube, but instead of ice, this is, it's in the water. So these experiments have similar optical detectors as ice cube, but these are dropped in, into the ocean, and these could see the light emitted by muons that are, are transverse in the water. This uh, experiment currently is being deployed at the near the coasts of France, Italy, and Greece. Now, finally, there are a couple of things that I would like you to take home from, from this talk. The first one is you might, be, you might now understand my fascination with neutrinos. I just think they are really cool because of the properties that I, we just, uh, I just described. And these neutrinos are small hidden things that we use to observe big hidden things, such as astrophysical objects. These, uh, they allow us to study the distant and very energetic universe. But because we don't have many of these neutrinos arriving to Earth, every year, and because these neutrons are mainly antisocial, we need big detectors to study that. There are several experiments already currently, sorry, there are several experiments that are currently taking data and more are planned. And if you would like to learn more about neutrinos or more about these experiments that I just talked about, you could go to the web pages of these uh, experiments, or you can, if you're interested, you can, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to tell you more about neutrinos or more about these experiments. And finally, to just wrap up the two talks, I just want to mention that things that we think are hidden are not really hidden, and that's good. Humans have developed ways to find things that we thought were hidden once we find hints that they might be there somehow. For example, Planet Nine, or these very energetic astrophysical objects that are millions and millions of light years away from us. Thank you. Did we miss people? Oh, interesting. Okay, I, I guess we are open for questions now. So if you have any questions, feel free to... I'm not sure what the format is here. Can people unmute themselves? I think that uh, the format would be um, to just ask questions using the chat function at the moment. Um, So yeah, if you have questions, please uh, type them in the chat. Uh, we have a question about the web telescope. Uh, I guess I can go first on that. Yeah, so what, the web telescope is very exciting and uh, it's gonna do a lot of great science. Um, it's at least in terms of Planet Nine, it's prob 
it, it will be more than powerful enough to detect client nine if it is out there. But test is already um, test is already up and running and uh, and is al also more than powerful enough to detect to detect Planet Nine. So by the time James Webb is in a position to do something about Planet Nine, hopefully that question has been answered. Uh, Jorge, is there anything uh, Webb will do for, for in the subject of neutrinos? Not really. I know that they can do stuff with dark matter, but not with neutrinos. Yeah, we have another question about Pluto being history planet-wise. Yeah, sadly, Pluto's not coming back. <laughs> Uh, it's it's very sad, but um, yeah, the the whole debate on what does and does not count as a planet could really be a whole talk on itself. I think there is a, a question here. Uh, have the neutrino detectors found anything interesting yet in the non-observable outer space? Um, no, no, not. Something that hasn't been uh, theorized. So there are some things that neutrinos detectors have observed. For example, we have observed solar flares. Um, so some of these neutrino detectors can really observe when uh, you know the sun emits these radio waves that reach the Earth, and and those are observed by the neutrino detector. So so those I don't know those are. I think the only things that neutrino detectors have, have observed that are, are not neutrinos, but uh, we we hope to someday maybe detect dark matter with them. So that'd be pretty cool, I think. Oh, so the question is, where does dark matter fit? So for the field of neutrino physics, there is not a lot of connection to dark matter. But if your question is regarding to J the James Webb telescope, we can, we can study dark matter by observing the motions of galaxies. So we, we, we can tell if there are things that we can't see by uh, observing the speeds of at which galaxies move. So if there's a speed that, if there's a galaxy that moves slower than we predict, we might be able to tell how much dark matter that a galaxy has, for example. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, let me know in the chat if I didn't answer your question. So I'm going to, Answer the, the next question is what information can we get, gain from neutrinos? How does the information get passed down and interpreted? That's a very good question. So, so when neutrinos come and interact uh, with the eyes, we, we measure the amount of light that, that these neutrinos produce. So depending on the amount of light and how how long these muons travel, we are able to infer the energy of the initial neutrino. So if we have the energy of an initial neutrino, and if we also have where this neutrino came from, we can predict what kind of mechanisms are accelerating these neutrinos inside the object that they point back to. So if these neutrinos point back to, for example, a black hole, we might be able to tell there are some processes in the black hole that happen that produce neutrinos, and we can roll out other processes that do not produce neutrinos. So, so yeah, that, that, that's how the information we get from measuring the light in the eyes allows us to tell more information about the, the astrophysical objects that, were, that emitted these neutrinos. So that was a, that's an interesting question. Yeah, we have another question, uh, a more personal question about when we knew this would be the field we devote our careers to. It's a good question. Yeah, so uh, I guess I can go first. I am a, I, I've, I've always been interested in astronomy since I was a kid. I think it's a very, um, I think it's a, a very natural topic to be curious about. Uh, 
And uh, I, I took a summer course in astronomy sometime in middle school. And that's when like, I realized, oh yeah, this is like, this is something that like I could, you know, that I could make a career out of. And went to, went to college, got involved in research there and basically confirmed that, yeah, this is, this is really cool. This is something that I, um, that I could keep going with. Yeah, for me, um, so I was born in Mexico. Uh, I moved to the US to start my PhD six years ago. So, um, so I was born in a little town in Mexico and my, my family had a farm. So sometimes I would get sent to the farm to you know, just uh, feed the chickens and look after the cows and all that. So there was a, a time where I found a book at a library that said uh, relativity. Uh, it was a pop sci book or magazine, I forgot. So as I was going to the farm, I grabbed the book and you know, I had nothing to do. I was just sitting on a, on a chair uh, watching the cows. And I started reading the book. And I think that's when I realized that I wanted to be a, a physicist. So that's my story. Oh, that's a great question. So here's another question here. How were neutrinos discovered if they are antisocial? So in physics, we have something called, uh, nu uh, there's a, a nuclear decay called uh, beta decay. So in this decay, a neutron becomes a proton and emits an electron and emits a neutrino. But back in the 1940s, I think, we did not know that neutrinos were emitted. So when people, when physicists were observing this process of, of uh, nuclear decay, they observed two particles. They observed the, the proton and they observed the electron. And there was some part of the energy that was missing. And we know I mean, it was, it was very well known back then that energy is conserved. So this is one of the first thing we, things we learn in, in, in a physics class that energy is conserved. So physicists were observing only two particles and there was missing energy. So one option was either there is um, a violation of the conservation of energy, energy is not conserved, and that would make everybody crazy, every physicist crazy. Or two, there was something else that was there that we were missing. So people were not happy with the fact that energy wasn't conserved. So what they did is, okay, we're going to go with the second option and we're gonna propose a particle called neutrino that maybe we will never see and you know conserve energy, but people were not still happy with that. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, studies about neutrinos and all that and how we could observe them. So in the end, we, can, we built a, uh, a very big detector where finally those neutrinos were observed and everybody was happy because energy was conserved. So, so that's how neutrinos were discovered even though they are antisocial because there was something there that you know, where it was, uh, there, there was some energy miss, missing there. And, you know, I think this is a great story with the title of our talks, which is hidden things. So again, the truth were hidden, but not really. We found some hints. Uh, I just want to um, let everyone know that um, thank you so much for your time and for, the, uh, for giving us this incredible presentation. Uh, I know I certainly learned a lot. Um, and just thank you again on behalf of the library and, and the community for uh, coming out and doing this talk with us. It was incredible.